Yeah. Smooth. Oki mm. of Oki's weird stories. Yep. It's also a weird story. <laughs> weird story. Uh, geez, I don't know. Like, uh, what do you want to talk? What's Should your talk? what's what's your, what's your favoriteest weird? Well, first of all, we're going to talk about the fact that you've been working on a, a weird story for okay. a year. But before we get into that, I want to hear a weird story. What's your favoriteest weird story to just tell people anecdotally? <sighs> kind of putting me on the spot here i um well there was i've already told this on another podcast before you have um, to tell a different story oh God. <laughs> why you got to do it that's the one that came to my i'm gonna just tell it anyway because i'm fine not gonna, i'm just not gonna come fine another one's not gonna come to me immediately uh my dad owns a pharmacy right mm-hmm. um and i you know i used to work there before like youtube and all that but uh basically a lady would come in almost every day right and she's uh She's on a wheelchair. Um, she's like quadriplegic. Well, not quite quadriplegic, but she's on a wheelchair. Anytime she came to the pharmacy, she would reek of, of urine, mm-hmm. right? Like really, really bad, like to the point that it would stink up the whole pharmacy. So, you know, like every time she came in, we have to like spray the whole place. Um, and yeah, like basically what happened is one night I was with my dad and we're going to the car um, after we closed up. And we see that lady in another car, in a taxi. And, um, well, she basically, she's being fucked. She's having sex. Mm. Uh, and, um, yeah, yeah, with a, with a normal-looking cab driver. And uh, basically, the only thing I, we came to realize, yeah, no, she's, she was, she's a prostitute. Mm. But then you have to think. The smell. Mm. And like, how much is she charging with that smell as well? Right. You know? Is that a discount or does that increase the price? Uh, I wonder. Depends. Depends on the John. What's the, what's the red pill analysis of that one, Brogan? The red pill analysis of smelling <laughs> like piss. <laughs> lowers your status. Lowers your value. L- l- really? Lower, yeah. Lowers your SMV? Yeah, lowers your SMV. But what about, what about the hierarchy of piss enjoyers? Oh, uh, see, that's a, se- that's a separate hierarchy. It's the yellow pill. The yellow pill? Yeah, yeah different ideology. Hmm. That didn't even occur to me that maybe he enjoyed the smell of the urine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, a, there's something to be saying said about it being so grody that it's like turn, turns you off. That it, it turns you off so much it turns you on. Yeah, is this... An, is this As a fetish expert, I'm, I'm qualified to talk about this. Mm. <laughs> what city is this in? Is this a city, town? No, it's in Toronto. It's I mean, Toronto? like, Etobicoke, if you consider... Etobicoke is part of Toronto, but you guys are both from... Well, you're from Nova Scotia, right? Yeah. And you're from Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, Etobicoke wasn't a part of Toronto until like, um, I think the late 90s. Mm-hmm. Same with Scarborough. It became the six. And then, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So then, like, I mean, you can, it's literally like the west end of Toronto right next to like Mississauga. Mm. Right. Um, so, yeah. How does, how does a fella get into weird stories? How does that happen? Uh, Coen Brothers. Okay. Do you know the Coen Brothers, the directors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vaguely. I'm not very culturally literate. Wait, what, what are some of their I movies? That. So like, like Fargo? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Now I know. Uh, Fargo and like, you know, um, Inside Lewin Davis. and I mean, they have like so many things that... Um, but anyway, they do this thing where it's like, uh, it's grounded in reality, but it's, it's surreal. Mm. So like in Fargo, I don't know if you guys, either of you seen that movie? Yeah, I have. So in Fargo... What <laughs> what happens in Fargo? I'm spoiling it. I'm That's sorry. fine. It's like I like I like it when movies get spoiled because I don't have to watch them. Yeah, th- yeah. Okay. So then, um, basically, at the end of it, Steve Buscemi gets like put through a wood chipper. But like the whole m- movie is like it follows this um, cop who's uh, pregnant, very pregnant, like about to deliver, and. Uh, you know, this this missing person's case, but it's like it has one foot in reality and one foot in the absurd. Uh-huh. So I just like like really absurd like things, but I don't like like ghosts. Right. So like actually fake, happened. Fake stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like what, you know, what I try and do with my with my channel. basically. Right. Yeah. And you have a very, uh, very artistic eye, I, I, I would say. You, well, thank uh, you. <laughs> you do like you do lo- really long form content. And you really make it an art piece, like an actual movie that you're watching or an actual documentary. Um, why don't you just shit out content on Eclipse channel and make a billion dollars? Um, for one thing, I don't know, man. Uh, you know, here's the thing, right? 
I could do that, but I don't even know if that would do well, right. to be honest. So there's a bit of a fear there. But then mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm, I mean, I'm doing something that I really like. And I like like learning about these things that happen in real life that, you know, like the whole thing about my channel is like the theater of the absurd. I like learning about the way that governments work and like how institutions work and like when someone does something very strange and has a very strange motivation how these institutions react to that person doing this very strange thing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of get lost in that. What's an example? What are you thinking of? I, I also, I, I relate mean, a lot to the idea of like, this person's weird. I want to understand where they're coming from. And then I want to understand the reaction of the broader world. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess like before I started doing this, I was writing, I was writing, I was writing like books and screenplays and like, honestly getting nowhere with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think any it, such cases mm. it's yeah actually Hideo Kojima I don't know if you know that guy Hideo, yeah he literally just tweeted about like oh I I wanted to make movies but then I decided to get into video games and you know now I'm I'm doing that mm -hmm. but yeah no basically yeah I think that like my my main motivation was like I want to make movies first and foremost as a director like any young person who gets into movies right and then I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can write screenplays. And then I tried that. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just try writing books. And I went back to screenplays. And then, then YouTube, and because I saw this video, I, th I told you this yesterday. Mm -hmm. I saw a video of a producer saying, oh, if you want to make it in Hollywood, what you have to do is you have to, now what you have to do is put things online and have Hollywood come to you yeah. kind of thing. So that was like, I had two screenplays that I was going to submit to um, like a contest. And then I was like, uh. and then actually I started making kind of stuff kind of similar to not quite similar, but it was like similar to you in, in a way where it was like skits mm. and it was like, um, but it was only about movies. So I'd be like, who's America's dad, Bill Murray or um, fuck, what was it? Uh, God damn it. I forget the other guy's name right now. But either way, I would get two actors yeah. and I would like pit them against each other in in a really stupid, surreal way, mm. basically. Or I would like I did. Who's the worst dressed directors? You know, so then who is the worst dressed? Director? Nicholas Winding Refn. OK, because he goes he goes on set and he's shirtless. Right. And he wears like a shawl. Like thing, or I don't know what a shawl is, but like anyway, he wears like like a skirt, like a loincloth, like a yeah, like a skirt thing. And a schizotypal director probably makes good movies. Oh, it's more autism. Yeah. Okay. He, he's very autistic, which is something a point that I made in one of those videos. Like it's this is because he also the thing is he does like in all of his uh, photographs, um, press photographs, he does the same pose. Mm. He does a fighting pose. Mm. Whenever he, he does a photo. <laughs> so I, found, I, awesome. I put awesome. together a collage of all of his fighting poses. <laughs> but then those videos, like, I mean, they did okay. Like, I, but like, I would just post them on like our move, like Reddit mostly on like YMS's Reddit, especially because mm. YMS was like, oh, okay, anybody can. I think he's changed the rule now on his Reddit, but you, you friend of the show, YMS coming to the studio. Is he actually? Yeah, he said he'd come if he was in the area. Okay, cool, cool. Um, he, yeah, anyway, so he, he had a rule where you can just like post your stuff on his, dis on his Reddit. So that's where I did it. And then eventually I'm like, I started seeing, you know, Frederick Knudsen? No. Down the rabbit hole? Yes. Okay. So him, and then I saw an internet historian and what they were doing. I'm like, holy shit, these guys are basically making movies on YouTube, mm. like documentary films. I'm like, okay, I kind of want to get to a point where I can do that, mm. you know? Because a lot of directors started out as documentary filmmakers, like, you know, directors who do, like, fictional work. Right. Um, which is still my intention. Like, eventually I want to, like, direct, like, fictional work. Mm -hmm. So then I started making uh, videos first, like, shorter videos. Um, if you could make a fiction movie right now, what would, uh, what, would the, what would the rough outline be? What would it be about? Alien comes to Earth and um, shows like, like shows a loser how to like be normal, right? <laughs> through this weird alien lens, okay. Where the alien learns like le alien learns very fast, 
because of course they have to be mega intelligent. Yeah. Right. Um, I think it might be like a parasitic, parasitic alien kind of thing where it takes over their body, but hmm. they like share a mind together. Hmm. Like an alien red pills, a loser. Yeah. Have you heard of a, uh, hmm, there's a musical where a, a, a high school kid gets um, this chip in his brain or something that just tells him exactly how to be cool. And he does exactly what he needs to do in order to be cool, but eventually it like takes over his brain and it becomes a problem. That's like what I, because I have it outlined. Mm -hmm. That's where I went with it, basically. Okay, with the I'm gonna I'm gonna find the name of this musical because this is very, it's like the the Rick and Morty episode. Um, oh, there's a Rick and Morty episode like that. Yeah, it's like Love yeah. Potion number nine. He drinks right. a potion. It does the same thing. He just knows exactly what to say, but then it gets so abstract to the point where he like he's in court. Morty's in court, and then they're like, "What do you have to say?" And he's like. Like makes a bunch of random noises, oh. and the judge is like, "That random compel that random sequence of noises was so compelling. I think you're a free man." Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he just, <laughs> our chat has has meshed together two different Rick and Morty episodes here. One where he gets a death crystal that shows him how he's going to die, and another where they take a love potion that turns them into Cronenbergs. Uh, uh, how foolish! Uh, uh, come on, you don't know that you're Rick and every single episode of Rick and Morty. It's all the same. Yeah. It's all the same to me. Yeah. You've you been, just got well acted lead, basically. You've been well you've, actually. <laughs> well actually, yeah. <laughs> you've, been, uh, you've been working for a year on your next weird story. Tell us about that. Okay, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, fundamentally, it is about a land dispute between uh, a family of cattle ranchers who ranch on public lands and the federal government that is responsible for administrating those public lands. Uh, and that um, federal administrator is called the BLM, hmm. a, you know, a.k.a. the Bureau of Land Management. Ah. And... Base libertarian anarcho-capitalist Chads versus BLM? There you go. I I, I don't know if they're anarcho-capitalists, <laughs> though. That's they, the they, they seem very anti-government, though, based off what you told They me. are, yeah. For sure. Like one of them ran with the Libertarian Party and he got like 17% of the vote hmm. in Idaho. And the other one also ran, but he got 3%, one of the brothers hmm. um, of the vote. Uh, but basically, yeah, no, it's like a land dispute. Uh, the These guys, the Bundys, they say that um, they don't own the land. They own the forage. They own the rights to the land uh, for their cattle to feed on the forage, right? Um and because their family has been there since 1877, uh, they say that, well, we've been here longer than even the Bureau of Land Management was a thing, right? Mm -hmm. But the catch is that the federal government actually has owned that, owned that land um, since America defeated Mexico in the Mexican-American Mexican War, right? So, I mean, they're wrong at the same time, but they have a really good moral um reasoning mm -hmm. for disobeying right so that they've been there like basically they, they were there uninterrupted untouched for not on un, uh, not uninterrupted right yeah so they have like they have family on their maternal uh cliven's maternal side of the family right and this is why it took me a year because like i ended up literally i have a family tree and i so, know so, everything so going bundy, back five, <laughs> bundy's a family and then cliven cliven bundy is the father okay um, and the whole dispute starts with him where he's like, I'm going to ranch on this land, regardless of what the federal government says, because what the federal government did, the BLM did in 19, uh, in the early nineties was they said, we're going to get rid of cow ranching in Clark County, which is where they are. Um, because in order to protect the Mojave desert tortoise, basically. Um, and therefore you guys got to go. I say, and this is all, what state is this in? This is in Nevada. In Nevada. So this is like southeastern Nevada, um, right next to Arizona. And then like, it's literally on the border, basically. It's like the extreme uh, east of, of Nevada, right next to Arizona. And then north is uh, Utah. And they're Mormons. So, you know, they, ah. their ancestors, you know, their forefathers, five generations back, came from St. George, Utah. Libertarian and narco-capitalist Mormons versus woke authoritarian BLM on the side of the tortoise. No, you're gonna like this part. When their family um, decided to go to the town, Bunkerville, which they're right next to, they basically 
went there on direction of the Mormon church in order to start a communist, basically, hmm. commune. Hmm. So they shared all goods in common, right? They shared, uh, they shared like labor. They lived together. Mormon and narco communists. There you go. <laughs> but eventually, I mean, that dissolved like within two years. Many such cases <laughs> with the, with the, with the anarchist <laughs> commune stuff. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's like, cause they, this was a way that, cause Mormons were worried because at that point, I mean, Mormons had run away from, um, from the East, Eastern states because they were being persecuted. Uh, and literally there was like, um, an extermination order hmm. issued against them, uh, in Illinois. Hmm. So they go all the way Didn't west. The Mormons got persecuted. Yeah, no, they got super persecuted. Huh. Like that's even like um, there was massacres and like uh, when Joseph Smith died, he was like shot by a mob in hmm. prison. Um, but yeah, anyway, so the Mormons they go west and they go to Salt Lake City in in Utah, which at that point when they got there, it was part of Mexico. So they were trying to get away from America. Um, as much as they can. And then what happened basically um, is, you know, it eventually became part of the, uh, America through the, it became a territory. Um, but what they wanted to do, and this is what they did with the Bundy forefathers, is they sent Brigham Young, the second leader of the Mormon church, sent a bunch of um, missionaries basically to go start towns all over the place. In Utah? Utah, Arizona, Nevada, Wyoming, you know, just basically the peripheries of Utah and the way in, to ensure that they were able to do this because one, the, the um, climate sucked. It's all desert there. It's a great basin and it's the Mojave desert. Right. And then Wyoming is quite, it can get quite cold. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, um, I don't know the way I said that. Uh, anyway, the um, thing is that, uh, yeah, so they sent them out there and it's like, you got to start, this thing called you have to f settle places based off of the united order mm -hmm. which this is the whole communist element of this whole thing where it's like you start these towns share all labor and goods in common in order to make it in really tough tough terrain and places like the, you know that are right. difficult but then they also have uh, uh american indians right that are you know, sometimes they get raided, their cattle get stolen, they get killed, right? Um, because, you know, they're encroaching on their land. At mm. that point, there's still wars between America and, and American Indians. Uh, and so they had to be very insular. They had to be very tight-knit. And they had to establish settlements. And they had to do it all together, you know. But then eventually most of them, there was like 200 of these. And even in... So Mitt Romney, you know Mitt Romney? Yeah, yeah, Mormon. Mormon and his ancestors came from, uh, were living in Mexico, actual Mexico, like Sonora, Mexico. Um, and yeah, that, that would, would have been a polygamous colony. Huh. Because the federal government would go after Mormons because about 32% of them practiced polygamy. Red pilled Mitt Romney? Mitt, Mitt Romney red pilled? Mitt Romney, uh, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, here's the thing, right? Like, the connection between Mitt Romney and the Bundys, like, it's not like a straight line, but it's, um, it's, it's close enough. They definitely, uh, share some sort of background, right? Huh. Because, like, even the Bundys, they, they had family on polygamous colonies in Mexico, um, until they were run out of that colony by, uh, rebels during the Mexican, uh, Mexican, fuck, what was it? Mexican, I think it was like a civil war or something. I, I forget right now. Uh, but anyway, I, I, you know what? I'm rambling. <laughs> what is, uh, no technology, multiple wives. Brogan, why don't the red pill guys convert to Mormonism instead of Islam? Uh, they're close. I just think Mormons are too boring in their head. I think they're, they're all little, uh, the red pillars, they're, they, they, romanticize they eroticize being islam because it's like a little exotic to them because they're all like white dudes white middle class dudes in america well not all of them sneeko and your date uh, and yeah a lot of them 
they're just like, oh wow, this is it. It seems more actually, exciting actually, being being a Mormon or being a Christian so boring, and then being like Islamic for some reason is like, wow, that's so fascinating. Don't you find the red pill is disproportionately non-white? I think it's a pretty big mixed bag. Hmm. Just dudes, just guys being dudes. Anyway, yeah, I think minorities kind of have it a bit hard when it comes to like women. <laughs> that's the yeah, thing. yeah, so that, that's then it I, I, That's why I feel like there's a higher than normal yeah. uh, red pill minority. Yeah, like, of like visual vis- visible minorities, like racial minorities. Yeah. Curry cell. Yeah. Curry cell, yeah. There yeah. you go. Et cetera. So these families have been, these families are Mormon and they've been there for like a long time settling yeah. these towns. And then these are the families, like the, the Clydes, are the Cli- Clivens? Uh, the Bundys. Bundys. So- Cli- Cliven Bundy is, um, so the whole thing with him started in the early 90s. Cliven Bundy, he's the fifth, fifth generation or fourth generation rancher. Uh, his family has been in that area for a long time, you know, um, and basically in the early 90s, the desert tortoise uh, is listed onto the endangered species list. Mm. And uh, Clark County, the BLM and a, multiple federal agencies decide we're going to get rid of cattle ranching in the region. But the thing is, too, which I mentioned in, in, in the doc, is that um, basically developers in Las Vegas – were developing on desert tortoise range, mm. but they were able to continue to do that, kill and even kill tortoises, destroy mm. their habitat because they paid a mitigation fee. Ah. Mm. Now, public ra- land ranchers by that point were like an anachronism, right? Yeah. Um, even like Clive and Bundy had like so many different sources of revenue because you can't just live off of public lands ranching, especially in the Mojave, de- uh, Mojave Desert where like um, it's arid, right? Dry. It's desert there's not much forage um so there's not much money in it right Mm. so public lands ranchers can't pay that mitigation fee that the developers do so they eventually they ban all um public lands ranching in clark county cliven bundy says no and he continues to ranch illegally for the next 16 years the bureau of land management eventually comes in in 2014 and they do this really crazy militaristic raid mm. of the Bundys and they, to impound all their cattle. And um, people see this because there's like First Amendment zones, way like super far away from the action where it's like, OK, you go into these First Amendment areas and that's where you can protest nowhere else. Right. And then there's like video, viral videos of Clive and Bundy's son and his sister, like his son's being tased three times and his sister's being pushed. Well, this is like a fucking like Waco Ruby Ruby Ridge type scenario. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And that's where it turn that's where it gets to basically where a bunch of militia groups start showing up. Uh patriot groups as well and like tea party people with like a lot of, you know, really big guns and then they get into a standoff, an armed standoff with the Bureau of Land Management. Um that it was very close to having like people die in that in that situation, but you know eventually Clive and Bundy's cattle are returned to him. The BLM retreats. Then two years later, his sons, emboldened by all the support that they that they've gained uh, through this win, they decide we're going to occupy a wildlife refuge for 41 days. So that's what they do. They go to Eastern Oregon and they occupy a wildlife refuge. Um, and they stay there for 41 days until the FBI kills one of their supporters. It's mm-hmm. really actually really important to the story. And how does the FBI kill the supporter? Oh, because they were. Oh man, there's so much to it. This is why it's been taking years. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is just, I, I've never heard of this. This is crazy. Yeah, I know. I, I never heard of it either until someone recommended it yeah. like a year ago. And uh, yeah, no, I started. Um, but you know, basically, so they. There's this thing called constitutional sheriffs. So the idea is that the county sheriff is the top law enforcement uh, authority in the whole, in the entire country. Because that's kind of how it used to work, right? About 120 years ago, right? The feds never meddled in local affairs. The county sheriff dealt with everything. And so the Bundys believe that that's the way things should be, right? Um, so they were going to go meet a constitutional sheriff 
who believes that he is the top authority in the land, uh, in the country, basically. Um, and then the feds, uh, the FBI, while they were driving to another town to meet this constitutional sheriff, they um, pretty much, you know, start set up a roadblock, uh, start shooting at, at the bunny's car. Uh, and then this guy, Lavoy Finicum, gets out. And um, this is a guy who he already wrote a book. He's like a survivalist. And he already wrote a book where the main character dies at the end with the shootout with mm-hmm. the feds. So he gets out and he's like, uh, go ahead and shoot me. Go ahead and shoot me. Mm. Right. And uh, the story is that and I mean, you can see the video and but basically it looks like he's going for his gun. Right. So then he got he gets shot. He gets killed. Like suicide by cop. I don't think it was that. It wasn't like suicide. It was more like um, martyrdom. Yeah, okay. he was ready to die. Yeah. The cause. I think just so. Like his video, just, like, just like his book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard because like, I, I mean, I, when I met his wife, right? Mm-hmm. I talked to his wife. Uh, yeah, you went down there and you interviewed these people in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I talked to another guy who was in that car too, Ryan Bundy, Cliven's son, and he still has like a bullet uh, in his shoulder. Like he refused to get rid of it because huh. he thought they were going to tamper with the evidence and stuff. This is like, he's also really wild, this guy. Like the FBI did like an uh, assessment of the Bundy family before they did that uh, cattle seizure operation in 2014. And they're like, this guy, Ryan Bundy, is the most volatile member of the family because he's like a hardcore sovereign citizen and he's, you know, he's really intense. Um, like we were, I, when I was with him, uh, first he's driving without a license, right? Which is like, Okay, all right, sure. We're in a rural area, driving without a license. If you get pulled over, we get great footage, mm. right? Um, but then he he goes to a gate that says "Do not enter property of the state." And then he gets his son to open the gate, <laughs> and he just goes through it like no problem. And he's like, "This, you know, this is our this is our land, basically," mm. is what he says. But uh, where was I? Yeah, no, it's uh, no, it's crazy. The whole thing, it's like too much. It's it's. There's so much lore to it. That's what takes so long. But let me let me let me bring you up, okay? So mm. let's get away from the details. What is the um what do you think the value of this story is? Like what do you think we can all get from it? Uh, what are the conflicts at play? What are we learning? I mean, how important is the rule of law? Mm-hmm. Especially if someone has like a really strong moral claim to an area. Mm. Like if you think about it. Marijuana isn't legal in the United States. It's legal in certain states and certain states that decided to legalize it. But mm-hmm. if the federal government wants to go in and arrest everybody selling marijuana, they can, mm-hmm. right? They but they just decide not to, right? So if someone has like a really strong moral claim to something that this is the way that things ought to be, mm-hmm. um how far is how acceptable is it to take things as far as the Bundys have. Right. Right. Um, yeah, it seems to me like a, a question of political extremism. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's totally fair to say. What is what is versus what ought to be. Yeah. 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 And they, but their thing too is like they, it's really, it's really complicated the way that they view things, right? For one thing, they don't believe that the federal government should have any authority whatsoever. Mm-hmm. They believe in like the Constitution is written. Basically, it was divinely inspired by God. Like that, the founding fathers they were channeling God when they wrote the Constitution. So they'll find parts of the Constitution that go along with their beliefs, but they'll ignore other things like the property clause. It's like, oh, the federal government can do pretty much whatever it wants with the land, right? Yeah. Or the supremacy clause. They'll ignore those kind of things, or they'll have some example of why it's wrong, right? Um, Do you know what the supremacy clause is? No, never heard of that. It's the supremacy clause. Basically, it's like the federal government is, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but basically it's like they have supreme rule when it comes to things like this, pretty much. Like, um, But yeah, anyway, so they'll ignore those kind of things and then they'll mix in Mormon theology as well. Mm. Um Cliven at one point says he doesn't believe in the Supreme Court at all. He doesn't believe that they have any um, 
you know, they shouldn't have any sway whatsoever. Mm-hmm. This is this is this is all very Mormon because the the Mormons did that with the Bible picking and choosing certain parts and then adding their own stuff. Yeah. And yeah. now they're doing the same thing with the Constitution, picking and choosing and then adding their own stuff. I should say, just to be fair to the Mormons, the Mormon church has disavowed the Bundys. Oh, interesting. Right. Like, they're not, like, excommunicated or anything, but right. they've, like, you know, when the Bundys were, took over the wildlife refu- refuge, they said, no, 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 we don't agree That's with That's lame. This. Mitt Romney should be there, like, in the shootout. <laughs> that would have been... That would have been great for him. That would have yeah. been something. So the... Wildlife's occupation is 2016. 2016. And then Levine Finnicum? Lavoie, fin- yeah, Lavoie Finnicum. Lavoie Finnicum. When, when does he die? 2016. 2016. In like Lavoie. February. So what, what's the big event after that? Is it just kind of like... Big event slow- is they win in court. They win in, they win in court. They win in court. Two uh-huh. court cases. Yeah. Um, against that, the BLM? Against the BLM, against the FBI. Um, they win basically off of technicalities. But before that, they I mean, they spent... All of them, like the main Bundys, spent two years in detention. They didn't go to prison, right? They were put into detention for two years awaiting trial. And most of that time, they're, they're in solitary confinement. Either way, Clive and Bundy is able to still operate his business, right? His son, Ammon, actually, who's the one who decided to take over the um, wildlife refuge, that guy lost out a lot because he had this trucking repair company. And then when he gets out of prison, he sees all of his employees are gone and stuff. Um, but Cliven was fine, the father. Uh, and Ryan Bundy, the, um, the one I mentioned earlier. The, the, the other son? Yeah, the one who uh, was uh, went through, like, was driving with a license. He, he really didn't have that much to lose. So I don't know how much he lost through it um, off the top of my head. Um, I think he's mentioned a couple things. But it wasn't as bad or severe as Ammon. But anyway. So two court cases come. Basically, uh, for one of the court cases, um, the um, prosecution didn't uh, reveal all of the discovery information. So this is a period in a court case where prosecution or defense has to share all of the information that they have with the other side. They didn't reveal all of that stuff. FBI was lying. Uh, so it's, this is called like a Bradley violation. Um, and then the other court case um, had to do with how many shots were shot at Lavoy Finicum. And um, so the FBI lied about that as well. Because if you watch the video, you can clearly see before he even gets out of the car, um, there's a shot that goes through the window, right? So they were shooting at him before he even gets out of the car. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, it was that. And Maybe that was just a warning shot. Yeah, <laughs> the, the car. Uh, it was real close. Stay yeah, in there. It was a real close one. Oh man. Um, and then uh, what else? What else? Okay. Uh, and then there was one other thing. Oh yeah. So the prosecution based their whole thing off of let's prove to a jury that these guys were trying to interrupt uh, federal, um, like basically the job of the federal employees at this wildlife refuge. And they couldn't prove that. But they based their whole case off of it. So basically, the Bundys won two times in court. Uh, Ryan Bundy ran for governor of Nevada. got 3% of the vote. Ammon Bundy, the more popular Bundy son, he got 17% of the vote in uh, Idaho. I mean, and since then, it's just like Clive and Bundy just continues to ranch his cattle. Uh, I mean, more recently, which has complicated things even further, Ammon Bundy, who I mentioned earlier, he one of the sons, he basically, well, basically he, he, he was protesting a hospital that, um, because one of his friend's kids were taken during like a welfare check, like basically, you know, uh, they're taken by the state. So he was protesting that he went to a hospital and then the hospital sued him and he refused to pay the money. And yeah, there's a whole thing where he's refusing to cooperate with them and it could, it's probably going to end badly. Mm. So it just continues with these guys. It's like nonstop, right? Um, but it's crazy because like at one point, Clive and Bundy was saying, oh, I'm never going to go to a federal court or I don't want to participate in a federal court because what, what happens when I go to a federal court and a federal judge sides with 
a federal agency like the BLM. I can't trust that. But now Ammon Bundy is saying, I'm not going to a state court. I want to go to a federal court, right? So I think that support for them has wavered, especially since they made the decision to take over the wildlife refuge. And the reason they even did that in the first place is because they wanted the feds to return all land to states. Because this was the federal government's attention originally, right? When, like, because they did the Homestead Act and, like, people can go, you get 40, uh, you get how many acres? Like 100 acres in a mule, right? From the government, right? So this was a way of disposing all of this land to people so they can settle, right? And it's good for defense as well because you have more people around. Um, but the feds wanted to eventually dispose all of this land back to, uh, the States. They never did that because the Taylor, because the Dust Bowl happened. You guys are familiar with the Dust Bowl? You slightly. So anyway, really bad environmental disaster. And then, um, you know, there was overgrazing on public land and there was, uh, uh, cattle ranchers were shooting at sheep herders. Uh, in range wars, there was barbed wire that someone would put barbed wire in, er, around a whole area and say, this is my my area. Mm-hmm. And um, basically it led to this thing called um, uh, the tragedy of the commons, where everybody yes. has a, a land in common that doesn't belong to them that they abuse. Mm-hmm. So then the federal government passes the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934. And then eventually, because the environmental... There's an environmental revolution in the 70s. Actually, Richard Nixon spearheaded all of this. He was behind passing a bunch of really important environmental uh, legislation. Uh, Like before that, there wasn't even the Clean Air Act. That was Richard Nixon. No. Oh, do you want mine? Can I take a swig of your Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, Actually, I'm almost done. I'm sorry. What was the Dust Bowl? Like, it was pretty much, it had to do with like, People overused the land and um, – Oh, that's so – so the Dust Bowl wasn't just something that happened. It was because of people – It was because of abuse and like um, – Wait, this is the I, 30s, right? 1930s, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's like really crazy pictures where it's like there's just dust everywhere and like really um, – yeah, it's just overwhelming um, where people are wearing masks and stuff. and uh, Health bar. Health bar. Oh, yes. Health bar. <laughs> I thought you said health bar. No, no this is like negative health bar. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, but since then, since the 1970s, basically 1976 is when the federal government's like, okay, we own this land. We're not actually going to dispose any of it anymore. Since then, there's been a fight. There was this thing called the Sagebrush Rebellion. Uh, and then there was the uh, war for the West in the 90s, and there was bombings and stuff. And since then, it's continued and continued. Um, and the Bundys are kind of like the head of that whole state rights public land user group. All right, our Chad. Bundys, yes? Uh, I think Hop, a couple of high testosterone males. <laughs> I think, fighting against depression. No, I think with the turtle thing. Yeah, I think of the turtles too. The, the tortoise thing. Is that a power grab? Power grab. What do you mean? Like, were they like, oh, we genuinely, our only desire here is to protect these tortoises? Or is it like, okay, we're going to use this as a vehicle? I to, think they're tortoise pilled. Personally, I'm on the side of the tortoise. To take power, to, to take land back. They already own the land. They already own the land. That's the problem, right? So I think, I think they cared about the tortoise. They were, like, they were like, oh, we have to protect this tortoise. They weren't thinking like, oh, yeah, this, that's, this is convenient for that, us. Because that's kind of what their job is, BLM. It, it's not only that they had to protect, they actually had to. Yeah. Because there was, there's legislation. It's written to law, the Endangered Species Act. They have to protect endangered species. So they have to legally because they got sued into, into making those regulations. Someone's got to protect these tortoises. Mm. But at the same time. The calves aren't really affecting the tortoises more than development. Development's the worst part. Development's really affecting the tortoises. Development, and, and, and there's nothing solar? stopping the development, right? Because no, they could just well, pay money. there's an invisible line around Las Vegas because eighty percent of Nevada is public land, mm. and there's a ring a lot around Las Vegas that you can't build further than this ring, right? So there is like, there is problems for developers in Las Vegas, as well. But like you know the. Las Vegas in the 1980s and 1990s, it, it was booming, mm. like really booming. So I think that they gave them more leeway 
for the sake of the economy. And by that point, public lands ranching, it's an anachronism. There's like far more effective ways of selling uh, meat, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, beef. It's like public lands ranching, even at that point, was like a percentage of the beef on the actual market, right? Mm. Um, Capital always wins. Yeah, pretty much. In this case, it's it's gentrification, basically, mm. where they got, they were too old and old school, I guess. Like, they, we don't need them. But we're, like, we're going to let ATV people, like, ride their ATVs on this land. We're going to let them build solar, which affects the tortoise a, a lot. Right, yeah. You know, we're going to do, we're going to let them build power lines, which also affects the tortoise. So there's multiple things that affect the tortoise. Mm. But for the cows, yeah. I mean, they trample on the soil and, uh, you know, they make it fragile and all this stuff. And they affect perennial herbs and, and all that. But they don't, um, they don't really have, like... Oh, a hundred percent knowledge that this is actually affecting desert tortoise. Mm. Yet another environmentalism L, but another capital W up top. Hey, oh, capital, capital yeah. wins again. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in this case, yeah, pretty much. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just it so fascinating that this is all just. Do you think it's going to bubble up into something bigger soon? The way like the way Waco did. Where it kind of just like brewed until or it came it have, to a head. Or would that have happened already? Do you think? <sighs> um, I mean, if you see sta scenes from the standoff in 2014, yeah, it looked like it could have because it was like, how many people is this too? Is this just the two brothers? Like, yeah, how big the, is the, the? Oh, group? the standoff was like because there was like 2,000 funny supporters went there wow. to protest. Okay, and militia guys brought like sniper rifles, you know, on, on fucking stands wow. and stuff. Like they were. Uh, and then the BLM was completely outnumbered, and then the FBI is up in a in a, a mess, of, like overlooking the whole thing. But if like a car backfired at that point, like, yeah. it would have been it would have been deadly. It would, mm. You know, a bunch of people would have died. Um, I think we should have armed the tortoises. That would have been. I'm really on the side good. of the tortoise. They could have just shot tourists. the cows, and then it's it's over. The tortoises. Yeah, yeah. they at arms. Yeah. Um, the Bundys must be fun as fuck to hang out with. Do you get like get drunk with them and party with them? Yeah, no, yeah. they're, they're Mormons. Them. Oh, they're oh, yeah. they <laughs> you can get oh, drunk with the Mormons. That no. sucks. No, but they were cool. Like, I mean, Ryan Bundy was really cool. Um, I spent we spent like three days. Me and the cameraman uh, Tate Haber. Uh, we we spent three days with um with Ryan Bundy, and then we had a day with Cliven, the the father. Uh, but he's like seventy seven at this point. Mm. He's not that articulate so it's like yeah i don't know how much i got from that interview like there's clips of cliven but it's not really but you know i'm gonna get some water yeah for sure uh but it was it was fun it was really it really was fun that was back in march when we did that so are these they're more they're like rednecks they're not like are they super articulate like kind of intelligent like really understand policy really understand what they're doing or are they just kind of like reactionary like i this is what i want um, I guess more of the latter, but at the same time, I think that they, there's a lot of, well, there's a whole lobbying aspect to this where they go to like conferences and, and are taught this by lawyers. Yeah. That this is actually true. So they believe it, right? Um, I think at, in some way they are deluding themselves, right? Yeah. Um, but they are ideological. They're ideological. They have to believe this. Okay. Right? Um, and it doesn't matter if it's legal uh, at all because they have to – they have this moral fight. So it doesn't – so basically what they want to do is they want to go on the offensive, put the federal government on the defensive, and win by threat of force um, because they tried – the courts they tried uh political means they tried um you know even trying to pass legislation um but they nothing works except for straight up disobedience okay. and in, in clive and bundy's case it worked he's still he's still ranching okay his cows are everywhere so that's yeah so it is coming to a point where it's just there there's a kind of mutual like don't don't fuck with us we won't fuck with you kind of like waco a, yeah. a little bit that's so fascinating have I never heard about this? Why is this so? <laughs> why is this not like a common knowledge thing that everyone knows is happening? I think the issue is it's just too hard to explain. Yeah, 
I think that's what it is. I think unless you know what public lands are in the West, too, that's a whole other element to explain. It's just, it's confusing. Yeah. Even his supporters, Clive and Bunny's supporters, they thought it was a fight over private land. That the federal government just decided to come in and attack an innocent man who was ranching on private land. Because that, that's what Ruby Ridge was, right? Are not ranching, but like he, it was that was his land, and they, it was his land. And yeah. they knew he, so it's not like an, it's not analogous because it's like that was actually a complete infringement of of the FBI. That was or whoever yeah. was the ATF at the time. Well, that was yeah. They they just went way too way too ham, basically. Yeah. Ruby Ridge. I'm not that familiar. With, like I know the story, but I don't know all the details of Ruby Ridge. I think it's basically just he lived in the in the woods, had a bunch of guns. They're like, why do you have a bunch of guns? And they kept like just pushed it to the point. Same with Waco. It was like Waco, they had a, they were arms dealers. Yeah. But legally, that's how they made the majority of their income at the compound was they would go to gun shows and sell guns. Mm-hmm. So they had a stockpile of weapons, but the stockpile of weapons was their inventory they sold they sold at gun shows. Oh, but it was okay. all completely le- legal. And they the the ATF just built up its narrative of like, okay, there's these people who live off the grid and they have 500 guns in a fucking room in this compound. Mm-hmm. And we have to go get the guns because they're eventually going to do something. That's why they have the guns. But they, they had the guns because they sold them. They didn't have the guns because they were planning to a revolution or anything. Mm-hmm. But they just escalate. Like the, the ATF just escalated it slowly. And Ruby Ridge was the same thing. They just escalated it to the point where they, they tried to take the guy out, the, the yeah. father who had the guns. Re- they, they Weaver. Up, yeah. Randy Weaver. Yeah, yeah, Randy Weaver. But they shot his wife. Yeah, and his kid. Yeah. yeah. So... That that story's all cra- all crazy, but it's not analogous because it's not private land. It's not private land. No, it's it's public land. They didn't go on his ranch. His ranch, his actual private ranch, is 160 acres. They they impounded cows on 600,000 acres of public land. Oh geez, lol. so yeah, yeah, his cows are everywhere. He has like, at least they said he had 900 cows. Just free roaming in free, Nevada. Free roaming, unvaccinated cows. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. That carry diseases, some of them. That's like Utah. When they tried to auction these cows off in Utah, Utah County Commissioner was like, no, we don't we don't want these coming here that and spreading diseases. Unvaccinated bull semen. Yeah. yeah. They, they, well they Well yeah, the bulls are like they <laughs> they um they attack people, uh some of the bulls like, but no, they yeah, they were like, Oh, don't come don't come to – don't bring these cows here because we don't want to spread diseases to these uh, other cows. And – oh, shit. There was something else that I was just thinking about there that was good. Um, ah, it might come back to me. Whatever. So that's so fascinating. And this is uh, – is so you're saying is support waning for this? Is it kind of like yeah, falling yeah. to the wayside a little bit? Like people yeah. are forgetting about it? I think it's – yeah, the years have gone by, but the Bundys like have shown that they kind of – I mean, they don't, they don't care about the rule of law at all as long as they get what they want. You have, know? have the Bundys been on Joe Rogan? This kind of seems like that should happen. No, but Ammon Bundy was on Tim Pool. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. And he told a completely, like, he told his side of the story, right? Unchecked completely, but right. So you, you, he's, he told a completely one-sided version of events. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Or um, you feel like you have both sides. I think I have both sides. I, I try and be neutral. So whose side are you on? Bundy or BLM? FBI. Uh, it's kind of hard to be FBI, on any other side. FBI, BLM, uh, tortoise-pilled uh, feds. I know you don't like centrists, but... <laughs> you can't uh, be in the middle. It's it's hard not to be. No, I get it. You're like a documentarian. You're just trying to capture it as it is. Yeah, but the thing is, too, like the feds, when they did that roundup, this one guy, Dan Love, was in, in charge of the 2014 roundup. And he goes, oh, we're going to go out there click, uh, and kick Clive and Bunny in the teeth. This is a guy who carries around a kill book. Like people that he's done missions. Oh, like He's done things before where he like uh, raided an uh, underground network of people trading uh, Indian artifacts. Um, and then one of them commits suicide, or like two of them. And he keeps them in his kill book. Hmm. Right? Jeez. Is so, it, this is a BLM guy or an BLM a special agent in charge, Dan Love. Now he's, he's, he finally, he, in 2018, he was kicked out of the BLM. Um, but that was only because, like, you know, there was just so much stuff coming out about him, like uh, using his position to get tickets at Bur- Burning Man and hmm. stuff like that. Hmm. But um, during the God. cattle roundup seizure, like, he just, like, yeah, go out there. And he was so gung ho, militaristic, crazy. Right. And he almost caused like a bunch of people to die 
because he refused to let go of the cows when the Bundys literally were at their gate ready to like, you know, go in and stuff. Mm-hmm. And like his superiors, like, get, just get rid of the cows. Like, give them the cows. Who cares? Just, there's no reason to have bloodshed over cows. Yeah. And he's like, no. <laughs> right. No, it, it, there's going to be bloodshed. Right. So he's a bit of an extremist on the other end. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of hard. And then the, what the FBI did in 2016 and then the um, prosecutors, what they did and like hiding discovery information. It's kind of hard to be on the federal government side mm. with this either. You know, mm-hmm. um, but the Bundys aren't the Bundys are incredibly stubborn, too. Mm. So I'm split as well because I, I like the political extremism of the Bundys, but I also like tortoises. It's cool that I know it's, it's, it's kind of like an interesting phenomenon as you get these libertarians with these persecution fantasies. Mm-hmm. Like it's, you see it a lot online of people who just like talk about their like home security and like their self-defense and all their guns. Like they have they, they want it so bad. They want like all their hard work to be to come to a head where they like finally can like kill a cop. Mm-hmm. And then you have those people in law enforcement who like are so paranoid about criminals and so paranoid about things going uh people breaking the law and all these dangerous people that are mm-hmm. out there gonna cause issues. But they also the 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 agents have like a persecution fantasy a little right. bit as well. Yeah. And it's all these people with pers- And that's the real horseshoe theory. Yeah, the, and also the real BLM. The persecution horseshoe theory? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, it's also the real... Because, like, you have the paranoid <laughs> cops shooting people. Yeah. BLM. BLM. Yeah. That's funny. The, um, have you ever seen, like, that commercial? There was one county um, police department, and their advertisement to get people to join the force was literally a tank uh, with uh, metal music in the background <laughs> and, like, skull insignias and all this shit. Fucking sick. And then you look at the Australian uh, advertisement promotional campaign for their police force, and it's a cop chasing a criminal, but then he stops to help an old lady cross the street, mm. right? He stops to serve the community. Yeah. He's not there to, like, go in with, um, you know, long barrel rifles and, and shoot someone, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's uh, – I think there definitely is, like, a culture in the States in particular where it's, like – yeah, I want to kill someone. I actually yeah. talked to a guy who joined the military. Before he joined the military, he told me, I am joining because I've always wanted to feel like how it feels to kill someone. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not saying everybody's like that, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah. I never yeah. thought about that. It's like you get that kind of the revolutionary spirit that the U.S. has, especially in the West. And then – you always see that kind of expressed in, in libertarians, but then you can totally like at yeah, police departments or any federal agency, you can capitalize on that spirit and be like, Oh, you want to like, you want to fight against something. You want You want to kill people. You want to be like a, a motherfucker, like join us, but mm-hmm. it's still the same. It's the same mentality. It's the same kind of thing they're trying to harbor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so different than Canada. Yeah. It's so crazy how you just go south of the border and it changes so fast. Cause like, I don't no. know, I don't know anyone in Canada that's, that's, that's like, that's passionate about gun rights or land rights, maybe like Albertans, but like nowhere east of Toronto, no one in Toronto is that gung ho about land. Yeah. Like the best we could muster was the, the convoy, the freedom convoy. And that was like completely nonviolent, just like people with trucks honking. There's horns. a lot of them were Americans too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 The, um, and the Americans loved it. Elon Elon Musk was like uh, tweeted like Canadian truckers are based or something like that. Yeah. Oh uh, no, it's crazy in Canada too because like eighty nine percent of our land is owned by the crown, right? Yeah. Um, but on guns, like I mean, honestly, I'm gonna be honest. I'm not that like oh we need guns and stuff. I'm not like paranoid. I just think guns are cool. Yeah, guns are pretty cool. I want to own a gun. I want to ha- own a handgun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're sick. Yeah. Can't deny that. Yeah. It's a common Canadian take. Yeah? Yeah, just liking guns. I like guns. I like guns. They're cool. Yeah. All right. Bang, bang. Yeah. <laughs> and then I like to, I like, I, I just want to have a gun just to have a gun. And then I want to fantasize about someone breaking into my home and killing them. Is that so wrong? No. It's not so wrong. They just take it out. You go, uh-oh. This world's going uh-oh. to hell. And that's a, a bad thing. But I, I really, I, it would be a shame if someone broke in and I had to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> what else? So... What else have you covered recently? You've been working on this documentary for a year. Mm-hmm. What was the, you said, like you mentioned to me, you've been to Africa a bunch as well. Oh yeah, when I was, yeah, younger. Younger. Yeah. yeah. 
Was that for anything or was that for? No, that was just family. Okay. Like Zambia. Uh, I've been to Zambia twice and then Kenya. That's cool. And Ethiopia. That's so cool. they have family there. Like yeah. all over? That's so cool. I have family everywhere. Yeah, because of the Civil War, Somali Civil War. Mm. So I got like family in Italy, England, um, Sweden, you know, anywhere that would take Somalis after the Civil War in the 90s, basically. We were talking uh, yesterday, uh, or no, two days ago, about um, um, the e-celebs with really messy rooms. Yeah. What do you make of that? I realized yesterday when I was, I, went, I was watching your videos, uh-huh. and I remembered, holy shit, you used to have yeah, a really I'm, messy I'm, house. I'm one of those, yeah. Oh, my God. Cause so so, so, for, so just to, like, you know, for examples, like uh, XQC, horribly messy house. Yeah. Um, too Mad, Rat's Den. Uh, yeah. Who else were you saying? Uh, me, obviously. You, I only realized afterwards because I saw this <laughs> video where you like have black mold in yeah, your yeah. sink. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, uh, who else? Fuck. Uh, Asmund Gold. Oh, yeah. Asmund Gold. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's just an e celeb thing. I think it's like, it's easy to live your life through a computer. Right. And not, and just forget about, well, you already said you're not detail oriented. I'm not mm-hmm. that. I've learned to be. Right. I don't think anybody is really like, oh, I'm this. You can learn. Yeah, but some people are more in- inherently detail oriented and they learn to be more spontaneous and um, free form. Yeah. And some people are more free form and they have to learn how to be more detail oriented. That's why that's what like personality spectrums like Myers Briggs teach you. Uh, Do you believe in MBT- MBTI? Yeah, I'm MBTI pilled. Really? Yeah, I am. Uh, because I, um, it, you know, there's a there's a bad rap about it, but when you get really deep into it, it's an interesting framework. I like I like superstitious stuff. I like astrology and I like okay. bunch of, I like nonsense. Actually, I know it's nonsense, but I like it. Young liked. Um, well, I mean, the MBTI comes from Jungian y- psychology, and yeah, yeah, but he like. You know, he went looked at horoscopes. And yeah, like, yeah, uh, it's it's all just interesting, fun little maps. Yeah. Um. So like, so which like, one are you? Uh, the internet calls me an ENTP. That's what the internet says. That's are you right. an ENTP? Uh, it's, I go off what the internet tells me. I, I'm socially constructed entirely, as okay. we've mentioned. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So the what what the ENTP cognitive function is is like basically the first. If you're an ENTP, you're chaos oriented, and then as you get older, you learn to orient towards stability. What, what was it? It was like, um, uh, what's it called? In, in, extroverted. Intuition. Intuition and then uh, introverted Introvert thinking? sensing. Sensing. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so extroverted intuition, yeah. that's first. Yeah. That's like chaos. That's yeah. like just making lateral connections every which way. Divergent thinking, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, but then the opposite of that is introverted sensing, which is order, stability, routine, um, just keeping your house in order, basically. Yeah, and then what do you get? The, um, introverted feeling. And then extroverted thinking. Uh, for, an, that? for an ENTP, it's uh, it's introverted thinking. Yeah, is your second one, which is does this make sense to me? Okay, and I feel like you have that a little bit because introverted thinking is like, um, it's not what is objectively correct. Brogan has extroverted thinking. That's what this is objectively correct. Okay, but we have intro, we probably have introverted thinking. I'm just guessing, which yeah. is like I want to understand this. Can I want to make this make sense to me? Yeah, and if I can make this make sense to me, I'm okay with it. So like, I I want to figure out why the Bundys believe this. And I want to think, figure out where the uh, BLM is coming from. Yeah. And I want to think, figure out where the neo-Nazis are coming from, who are opposed to BLM. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I don't... See, I was really into it. Uh-huh. I got e- ENFP. Right, interesting. That's what I was... Or It was either ENFP or ENTP. It was, hmm. it was either or. Which, apparently, those are completely different. They're, yeah, they're, they're actually very similar, ENTP and ENFP. Yeah. They both have the chaos function first and then the order function last. Yeah. With the extroverted intuition. Yeah. First, yeah. And then what are you? I, are you an I? S- I'm ENTJ. ENTJ. Okay, so everybody's, uh, what is it? Fuck. Intuition yeah. based. Well, because we're all, we're talking about abstract things, basically. And yeah. even when we talk about specific things, we're using it to like, what is the abstraction of this? Yeah. But anybody can do that. Anyone can do that, yes. Yeah. But it's, it's what you prefer doing. Yeah. So like if I prefer, like if, if I'm baseline a, a mess, but I have to learn how to become um, orderly and clean my room, mm-hmm. then that's probably your more chaos. You're like, your first function is chaos. Yeah. But if you have like a really clean room and you don't know how to like have fun or relax or unwind or let things be a little messy sometimes, then you need to learn how to do that. Then you're probably order function first. Yeah. And then the opposite of that is like an ISFJ or an ISTJ or something. They have like introverted sensing. I just, you know, okay. 
You said it was like a good framework, basically. It's a fun it? framework. Okay. All frameworks are like miss reality, obviously. What does that mean? Well, like a framework is um, narrows reality. Reality is very complicated and messy. It doesn't make sense to you. You apply a framework to it. It's kind of like you draw like a triangle in, in a bunch of mess and you're like, this is the world. It's not the world, but it's fun. Mm-hmm. That's how I view frameworks like astrology and MBTI and stuff. Cool. Okay. I mean, I, I, like, I, to, like if I were, if I was actually trying to do like a scientific study or something, I'd probably go with uh, like ocean, like big five. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, I mean, that's pretty much what Peterson does. Yeah. But, I, but Peterson completely discounts MBTI. I like MBTI. Yeah. It's fun. I got MBTI pilled by Frank James. Friend of the show, Frank I, James. I saw that video. He's going to, he's going to come on here as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I saw that. I saw that video. That's how I knew that you were into that. Because I, I used to watch his videos. I used to be no. quite into it. Um, Scroll and get your crumb of dopamine from when he says your type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. They do it. But see, he's the one who does the skits, right? Yeah. Of each type? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think of MBTI? It's fun. I, I think I'm too, uh, I don't know. Brogan's a really good example of, uh, of his type, actually. Because he's um he's an example of a well balanced ENTJ. Mm-hmm. So the ENTJ's first function is extroverted thinking, which is this is objectively right. This is how it is, and you do this and you do that. It's like a commanding type, a leading type. But then the opposite of extroverted thinking is introverted feeling, which is his values. Mm-hmm. So his he's a well balanced type because his his um his raw I'm gonna go in this direction is balanced out by his like internal values, and like he actually has his internal values. But an unbalanced version of your type would just be like, I got to make a bajillion dollars for no reason, because I don't know why, but it's actually because your like, mother beat you when you were a kid and you don't understand that. Mm-hmm. But like he has a pretty good connection with his internal values. From what I remember, if you have J, you're someone who's more so goal-oriented, future-oriented, responsible, or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, J, J is just judging, so it's like um, you're, you're quicker to come to a conclusion about things. Like if J type, here's your story about Bundy versus the BLM. And then they're like, oh, I'm on this side. Like immediately. They just know because they're val- their internal. Like they're just like, this is right. Or it's like, this is what is this is what I should do. Mm-hmm. P type has harder times making judgments. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, as soon as you started talking, I was like, I'm on the Bundy's. So <laughs> yeah. I, it's before the story, before I like before I even knew what the story was, I was like, yeah, I'm, like, I'm against the feds. Yeah. How, wait, how do you feel now? Still. Still, you're on the Bundy side. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, I usually just, whatever the, whatever the minority group is, I'll side with them. That's kind of like my... The underdog. Yeah, that's my like, axiom. Hmm. They are an underdog. That is true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know about... And Have you ever heard of... Oh, shit. What was the other one? There's another one that's like way um, more woo-woo. Like <laughs> more woo-woo type of... In terms of personality? Uh, Enneagram? Yeah. Yeah, Enneagram. Enneagram. Yeah, I don't know much about Enneagram, but I would like it if I knew about it. Okay. <laughs> That's my axiom. I'm insane. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I'm going to look you up because you, you, someone's probably talked about your MBTI type. Oh, they said like, I'm an INTP. No, you're in. Uh, oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Okay. Weird stories. Because there's a website where they rank every public figure. And you're on here. You're an INTP. Yeah. That's but- what I thought. Wait, uh, wait, yeah, yes. You, the, but that's only based, see, that's only based on the type of work I exactly. do. Exactly. Which doesn't come naturally but, to me. Yes, really. exactly, exactly. All, all this stuff is just like how people perceive you. So yeah. you are perceived as an INTP. Yeah. But also that makes sense. To well, me. I'll tell you something. I went to, so I went to a military school uh-huh. for a year and a half, right? A boarding school. Yeah. That's why I'm tidy. Okay. Because it was drilled into me. Right. Right? Um, what I'm doing now uh, I didn't do that well in school, but you know, I taught myself to write. I taught myself to find things. I, I force myself to do things that I, I naturally don't feel like come to me naturally. Yes. So what comes to you naturally is your type. But I think also what comes naturally to me is forcing myself to do things. Right. Right. So I don't know. It's, I think it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. It's, it's a good frame. Good framework. It's a, it's, it can be objectively a bad framework. It's just fun. It's a fun okay. thing. But like, okay, so here's my analysis of you as an INTP. Okay. Introverted thinking is, can I make this make sense to me? Uh-huh. It's, it's so effectively, like, when you're, when, you're, uh, when you're writing about the Bundys or whatever, uh-huh. um, that's trying to figure out where the Bundys are coming from. And that's trying to figure out where BLM comes from. Instead of just being like, this is right. This is the right side. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's na- that naturally predisposes you towards Whoa. despicable centrism. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Um, 
And then, uh, and then you have extroverted intuition. That's your second function. That's like creativity. That's like why you have, why you what predisposes you probably to looking okay. at it artistically and gathering information in kind of a, like a lateral scattered way. Okay. Yeah. And, we, and then uh, introverted sensing is third. Introverted sensing is keeping your room in order, um, basically. That didn't come to me naturally. Didn't though. come to you naturally. I but, used to be a big mess. Right, but it's your third function, so it's something you can master. It's yeah. not like super weak. But yeah. Then your weakest function is extroverted feeling, which is how other people feel about you and perceive you and being perceived. <sighs> See, here's the thing, right? Like, okay, I never got INT, INTP, uh -huh. but if I did, right, who I am might change based on who I talk to. Yes. If I'm more comfortable with someone, I just get met you guys like a couple uh -huh. days ago, right? Yeah. So, of course, I'm going to be a little bit more guarded, right? Uh -huh. um, but if I'm my, with my close friends I've been talking to years, I'm more extroverted, right? Uh -huh. It depends on the situation. Um, the other thing is, right? So, say if I got INTP, mm -hmm. and that's like 100%, that's what I am. Um, which I don't think you believe. Um, say I'm an INTP with anxiety. Yeah. And I'm hyper aware, or at least I think I'm hyper aware about the way that people perceive me. Uh huh. So then what I, what am I in that case? You're still an INTP. You're still an INTP <laughs> with anxiety. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing with uh, the issue with these frameworks is just, it, 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 it paints personality as this static thing. That doesn't change based on context. Um, and we don't, we think that's bad. We kind of think that's inherently bad. Like so many people have, have this internal insecurity of, you know, putting on a different mask all the time. Like, oh, this is how I act when I'm with these people. This is, and they think it's a bad thing to act differently around different people. But it's like, that's natural. Yeah. So that's what you should do. That's like a good social function. You yeah. shouldn't just always be, imagine if I, if I treated everybody I met as if they were like my best friend for 15 years. I'd be a fucking weirdo. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, you're going to get taken advantage of. Yeah. So it's gonna, eventually that's what's going to happen. Or if I'm, at a, if I'm at a funeral. Oh, that I'm would be And I'm talking to everybody as if like, as yeah. if I've known them for like 15 years. Like I'm not putting on a little bit of a mask, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you should a little bit. And it's, it's fine to do that. And I just don't think the personality models take that into account. And when they do, they always have some weird explanation. It's the same thing like horoscopes. Like when you mm -hmm. read your horoscope and like, it's like big opportunities are coming f to you, but be careful of temptation. And you're like, oh, this is so me. Yeah. And it's, well, like a, it's just like a big, broad brushstroke. And it actually does take that into account. So like if you are dominant, extroverted feeling, you'd be really good in any situation. I could throw you into any party. You'd yeah. be the life of the party. You would like get along with everybody. You'd be like, oh, I like you, blah, 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 blah. I've got a friend like that. Very draining. Um, and uh, if it's inferior, it doesn't mean that necessarily that you're really bad at that, but it's something that comes least naturally to you. It's the smallest part of yourself. And it's the part that you have the most... Um, you, you, you try to like think yourself into being able to match with every group, but you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, because that's your inferior function. So that, that's, that's basically the MBTI explanation for that. But it doesn't really matter. What do you think about community? Community. We're trying, you know what we're doing here? I like we're what you're doing We're trying to create here. a physical flesh space community. I like what you're doing here. Yeah. I really do. I, I really do. I like the idea of it. I told you this like yet, um, two days ago. Mm. It's a great idea. And I told you why, right? Because it's like, YouTube, doing YouTube is very solitary. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, there's a lot of people that don't like, yeah, we, you said it the other day, like, oh, you have someone with a million subscribers, but doesn't have like- No homies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, million subs, no homes. It's rough. Yeah. It could be rough. Like, I'm not saying that I don't have any, like, you know, I have friends from like, well, you know, from high school mm -hmm. and- But it's important to have a community of your peers as well. Like exactly. We're doing what you're doing for money. Because it is, that's the other solitary thing is like, if I go and I explain, I've been working a year on a, a documentary that I'm going to put on YouTube to someone who, who doesn't really know what that is, or even someone who knows what that is, but doesn't understand what goes into doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, where I feel like you guys kind of understand it. Um, yeah. Even though you're like, I think your content's more kind of similar to me because you're like more so uh like you do like longer videos and yeah mine have like a, like a like a narrative like there's like there's climaxes and yeah and finishes and mm -hmm. oh so you actually go based off of like a narrative structure like that too yeah i tried to but my videos are more like max 15 minutes oh 15 okay like and he weeks. does a lot of research for his work and stuff okay yeah, yeah. well i mean yeah and i think you you because you you do a lot of videos like you're always making videos so you understand that 
like it takes a long time to do things. Like, yeah. 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 But, um, no, it's tough. It, it, it really is. It, it can get lonely. Yeah. So I like the idea of having, you know, a bunch of people get together that understand each other. Yeah. 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 It's funny when we started doing this, I, I, I even like going into it, I was like, oh, this is a, uh, this is so just seems like, I don't know. It's so simple. Like it's such a simple concept that it's novel, mm -hmm. right? Where I'm like, oh, this is just like an obvious thing to do. But how many people are like, oh, this is really cool. I'm like, it just seems like a natural thing to do is like build a community with other people who do the same thing. Yeah, but, but no, like, no one does it. It's no one rare does it in Canada. I, mean, it's I don't the, know what that is. Why, why is that, do you think? Yeah, like you're saying the Australian YouTubers all hang out with each other? They do. It doesn't matter if you have like even 300 subs, they'll hang out with you. Like everybody yeah. hangs out together. Canadian YouTubers. I guess it's just our culture. We're more atomized. Yeah. It's oh. cold. Atomized. We stay in our rooms. We wait for people to come save us. Yeah, Canadian, that's the Canadian culture. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, oh, I'll just get invited to a YouTube community. Well, we're saving. Yeah, we're the savers. We're saving. Because like, I was like, I, I was waiting around for someone to save me. I'm like, no one's going to do this. I got to do huh. it. Yeah, get it created. No one's going to invite you. But I think you. this goes back to the rat's nest e-celeb uh, archetype. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, because like you stay, you live through your computer screen, and your mess paws up around you, and then... You don't yeah. see it. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't even occur to you. Like, if you like have that, like, well... I'm basing this off of what Asmongul said, mm. right? So I don't know if you're familiar with this guy. He's a World of Warcraft streamer. Yeah. And I've seen his, I've seen his clips. I can, th I can think of his, of his face. Yeah. yeah. And so he, his house is, it's horrible. Jeez. Really? It really is. Um, and this guy's probably like a millionaire. He's like a close. millionaire. He, and he, and he, well, he lives in his, in his mom's house. His mom's mm -hmm. dead now. He has a oh, lot yeah. of money. I don't know if it's like, I feel like he's actually, being honest that he lives there yeah he doesn't want to move but he's he only lives his life through his world of warcraft character and his streaming and then he he literally says it himself that i don't see any any mess around me i don't notice things like another person does and he's kind of trapped mm. right like he doesn't he's never moved out right Just, that's you know that's not the thing is like there's a a few steps that he has to take that to realize that his situation is something that can be fixed, but he doesn't have to. He he has so much money, right? Uh, and then, um, like, recently he invited people. And it was literally a video making, like, it's it's people who are part of his, like, um, company that he put together, organization that he put together. So they're friends, but it's a video, ostensibly, that's making fun of him and is and – disgusting house mm -hmm. and he acts like he's not affected by it but I, i'm not i'm not completely sure mm -hmm. right so i don't know there's something to that you have to be affected by it like if you're just if you live in squalor it just it eats away at you yeah yeah that's like, so crazy though how many people live like that how many many people, celebs yeah yeah people like with that. money and status and fame and like they really just if they wanted anything they could just grab it. Like if they mm. wanted like friends or women or to party or like anything, they could capitalize on it. They don't do it. They just live the way like a 13 year old lives, mm -hmm. especially men, mm. men, men have this tendency to, yeah, like put the entirety of themselves in something. I mean, there's like, you know, like people who play video games who don't even stream, like they're not even making money off of it, but it's mm. like still their whole, their whole concept of progress in life is invested in a video game mm -hmm. or People who start people starting businesses, it's the same thing. Like it's more conducive to success, but you see like people just eating pizza once a day and like working for 14 hours a day. Yeah. Right? A lot of guys just yeah, they, they it like it hijacks their sense of purpose. Yeah. Where they like let everything everything else doesn't matter. Like cleaning your room, exercising, eating healthy, like is just irrelevant to this one thing you're doing. It's a grind set. Yeah. Yeah. Goblin mode. Goblin mode. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so weird. Yeah, and it just it just eats at you. It corrodes your soul. Like if you just if you live in squalor, if you have no community, just and there's also something to be said about like you you stop trust. If you're not a healthy, balanced person, you uh -huh. can't really trust yourself. Yeah, like especially if you're writing, if you're trying to produce something that's like at all intellectual, or like requires any heavy thinking, and you are physically unhealthy, um, your diet's bad, you have no community, like you're missing like all the hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Like you can't trust your own ideas. You're not going to produce good ideas. I don't, yeah, ideas don't uh, occur in a vacuum. Yeah. Like that. Any, any ideas you do have are going to come from a kind of corrupted worldview. Like that they're going to they're gonna be easily, 
kind of like he could like misinterpret them. Well, yeah, like all women are this because I watched Fresh and Fit, and yeah, those are the women that I know about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My only concept of women are like yeah, OnlyFans models that go on Fresh and Fit. This is yeah. this is all women are like this. Yeah, yeah. So weird, man. Do you do you ever um want to do anything in Africa? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about doing a well, I'm kind of started it already, but in the background, I, I want to do like a big video on Somalia. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah, like I want to go there, you know, I have family there. Um, there's safe parts of Somalia. The, the north half is a, is like a sovereign. Like, there's two sovereign. There's two sovereign. Like they have their own government, don't they? Yeah, yeah. but they're um, autonomous uh, entities that don't have like the they're not recognized by the whole world, right? It's like the way like Kosovo used to be or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so there's Puntland, which is where my family's from. Um, and that's on the, I think it's Northwest. And then on Northeast is Somaliland. So that, that is, um, more people have heard of Somaliland, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I, I know Somaliland. That's like, usually when someone makes a video, they go to Somaliland. Um, and it's doing much better. Um, is there a Somali world? That would be great. If Somalia gets a, gets everything together, yeah. right? You got to make a Somali world. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, no, the, um, yeah, I would like to, I would like to do like a really big documentary on Somalia eventually. Cover, like cover the civil war, cover. Cover the culture, the history, the civil war, where it's at now, all that go there. You know, um, that would be nice. Yeah. What's so what's safe? And because I was like growing up, I, I had this conception of like Somalia being the most dangerous country in the world. Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't hear about it as much anymore. It's more dangerous in the um, south where the so the, the main terrorist group is Al-Shabaab. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of factions still fighting. Right. Um, so. It, no, it's tough. Like if. Like um government official, like a president would be put in, and then people try and kill him. Right. And this is like Mogadishu. It's just like the Mogadishu is in the south. And that's part of like that's not part of a sovereign area, that's part of Somalia. That's part of Somalia, yeah. Um, but uh I think Mogadishu now is is a bit safer, but there's definitely places in Somalia where you just can't go. Um my mom went uh to some of the most dangerous parts of Somalia um twice throughout the two thousand tens. Uh, and she wore a bulletproof vest and like, um, you know, like armored helmet. And, uh, no, she had some crazy pictures. I've shared them on Twitter before, but and I eventually I deleted them. Um, cause I like, well, it's like her. And she's like a guy with, um, a chain of bullets for, uh, for like one of those, um, fuck, what are they called? Machine, <laughs> machine gun, yeah. machine gun. Yeah. <laughs> so he's got that all around him. He's got like three guns and. Uh, just like blown up buildings and stuff. And, uh, she went there, she was training nurses. She's a nurse. Um, and the, like the state of hospitals and stuff is like really, uh, grisly. And, uh, you know, so she had, she has a lot of crazy photos and stuff that, um, and last time she went, she was driven by a guy, uh, who a week later was dead, mm. you know? Jeez. So there's some parts and then she knows another lady who's um like a journalist like uh and she had like a show and stuff and you yeah, know she stayed in a in a hotel uh, her and her husband and that hotel was bombed uh and yeah no it's really sad that she died her husband died and they have kids uh and so the kids were orphaned um so it's not safe in some places but you can go to like somaliland you can go to um garway um you know and you land and stuff and yeah some places are much more safe than others is this like a, an ideological war is it a religious oh it's war? Cl it's clan clan it's clan so somalis are all part of one tribe um and the forefather is somali right mm. so s-a-m-a-l-e which isn't spelled like somali how it's spelled um in english and stuff right um and so you can trace your uh, forefathers, back, uh, all Somalis have a connected um, forefather, basically. You know, like you can keep going back. So my full name, 
is actually, I'm not going to say my full name, but it's my, my name, my dad's name, my grandfather's name, my great grandfather's name. And you can keep going back. Wow. So people know uh, their lineage. Hmm. And you can keep going back until like 25 uh, names later. And then if you're talking to another Somali person, if, especially if they're from the same tribe, uh, from the same clan, excuse me, uh, then they can find a common ancestor. Hmm. Mm. So, Somali's in the year 2300. I have too many names. <laughs> you have to like, uh, do you, so you, you know all your names going back to. No, I don't know off the top of my head. No. Oh, okay. No, but there's like um, a list. Like, um, so you know Ilhan Omar? Yeah. So she's part of my same clan. So oh. in a way, yeah, she's related to me, right? Um, so that's like kind of how it works with clans. But I mean, that clan too is the second largest clan in Somalia. So, mm. um, so you're, you're clansmen with Ilhan Omar. Is that the right word for it? <laughs> clansmen, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> clan kin. Clan kin, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, but you know, Somali is interesting. It's, um, cause there's actually like a lot of ancient history there too, because it's part of the Silk Road, um, which is like a trade network. Um, so we trade with, uh, ancient Rome, mm. India, you know, it's so close to the Levant. Uh, it's like, uh, the Gulf of Aden, um, is connected to, uh, you know, it's the Indian ocean is connected to Yemen. Uh, right. And then Yemen is uh, part of the Middle East. Right. And then you just go north and there's Saudi Arabia. Right. Um, so it was it's like because it's on the Horn of Africa. So it's a strategic like and good like network place for trade and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of history in Somalia. And it's really unfortunate that there can't be like archaeological studies because it's too dangerous. Yeah. Um, but like some of the most ancient uh, cave paintings in the world are from Somalia. I mean, East Africa is the cradle of civilization. That's where everybody comes from. Um, it's, uh, so there's a lot there. Um, Somalis were first to domesticate the camel. Um, but um, it's, it's hard to do any research or archeological stuff because you're gonna probably die. If you uh, do a video about it, are you going to start it with like, I went to the most dangerous place in Somalia oh. <laughs> and one third of my camera crew was killed. Yeah, man. <laughs> Who's that guy recently who um, he, he, he illegally went on train rides through Japan and India. And oh, he yeah, like, I, I know, I know these, um, I know these style of people. They like hitch trains basically. And he, he also made a thumbnail where he's like, I went to the poorest nation on earth and it's him doing this and yeah. there's a bunch of poor African kids. Yeah, I know, I know, I know the thumbnail. Is it the same guy who like gave candy to an African tribe? I, I and the thumbnail is like him with a Sour Patch kid like pointing it at a woman and she's like, her face is edited so she's like crying. Oh man. It's like I, some poor African woman. And it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a cool idea but the execution is terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. The Mr. Beastification has gone too far. What do you think of Mr. Beast? Uh, we don't, we're not allowed to talk about Mr. Beast in the studio. That's one of the band words. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it's, it's Satan. It's too, it's just a band word. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk about Mr. I, I, I respect Moloch, okay? That's what Moloch? I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> You're a Moloch fan? <laughs> I respect him. He's really good at YouTube. Let me elf bar that. Yeah, let me, yeah. Let me go, get, go let me for get an elf bar yeah, in my brain. And then, then I can form an opinion. Yeah. I, I like Mr. Beast. Yeah. I, I can't really find, like, I feel like I'm pretty good at vibe checking people. No. I, I can't find, like, the uh, the chink in his armor. He seems pretty, just kind of like, I can't imagine him having, like, some weird skeleton in his closet. He just seems like a normal dude. Yeah, he seems really he's too normal. normal. Like, even, like, the Joe Rogan podcast, he's yeah. so normal. Yeah. He doesn't see he's not, like, that narcissistic. Like, he's just such a normal person. Yeah. And he's good. He's really good at figuring out YouTube. Like, he understood it. In a way that no one else did. This is why we're not allowed to talk about Mr. Beast. It's because like, you have like you can. There's four possible opinions to have about Mr. Beast. That's like a political compass, and I've heard them all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. We can. We're we're a pro Mr. Beast um, studio. Um, pro Beast. What do you think of Willem Dafoe? Jean Paul Search. Yeah. What is that? I don't understand why. Do you want to show, show that uh, picture off to the audience while we talk about it? Uh, that's a hung up. That's all. We can we can also just turn the camera around for a second. Hold on, I'm gonna turn the camera around. You guys keep talking. All right. Uh, 
No. So what is, what's the whole... Did you do that? Yeah. Oh, that's good. I just draw on stream. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you know how to... That's quite good. Yeah, I draw on stream once a week. Uh, it's Will Defoe, and I wrote Jean-Paul Search on it because it's they, they look like very... They have the same like physiognomy. They don't look similar at all. John, That's a John, philosopher, right? Yeah, but he's like he's like five three and has like a lazy eye. and looks like a frog. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, just it's 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 funny. Is he one of those guys who signed that? Um, he did. That, yeah, he did. you already knew what I was going to say. He, he did sign that. And his wife signed it. <laughs> I don't get philosophy. I'm going to be honest. I don't get it at all. I don't, I don't. It doesn't. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it's like really. The, I feel like the ideas in philosophy are explained better elsewhere, mm-hmm. right? Um, especially when you read like that really, really, really academic shit that you can only really understand in the context of a PhD. Mm-hmm. I just I don't see like how that benefits the average person other than like propping itself up being like you have to go to school to understand this. Now you understand this. Right. Now, you, now you can teach this. You're, you're reading the burnout society and there's a lot of academic jargon, jargon in that, right? By I just young like, Chong. Young Hol Chong. Yeah, I just hate Close academic enough. jargon. Oh, so what's that? Uh, the Burnout. Burnout Society. Yeah, because that's that's your next video, right? You're gonna be referencing that. Yeah, the Bur- the Burnout Society. He basically posits that most of human, most of Western history, the the fight, the individuals' fight has been against uh, has been for like emancipation. Like we're breaking free from boundaries. We're breaking free from constraints. We're like all through like the 50s, 60s, 70s. We're trying to get more self expression, more opportunities, more freedom to do what we want to do. Mm-hmm. And now we have like pretty much all the freedoms we have. We, 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 you can do anything. Yeah. Right. Anyone can be a millionaire. There's nothing stopping anybody from, anybody from doing anything. Yeah. And now our issue is excess freedom, like excess possibility. Yeah. And all of our, all of our issues now are like mental health issues, ADHD, BPD, things that you can frame in the context of excess opportunity, excess freedom to just like do whatever you want all the time. And then everyone just sort of feels guilty for existing. Yeah, because it's like you can do anything. Anybody can be a millionaire. Anybody can just spend like ten hours a week on the computer, or ten hours a day on the computer, and do drop shipping and be a, a millionaire. And no. we do, and except you, for the, the millionaire part, I guess. Wait, but like, any, like technically anybody can. Yeah. And then it's like, why aren't I doing that? I should be doing that. And you start you start feeling guilty for just existing, for like literally doing anything besides working. Yeah. And now our all of our issues now are like depression, um, becoming a burnout, being a loser. Like th- those are the Whereas before the issues were like being a criminal, being a madman, being insane. Yeah. Um, those because are, we had a different kind of society before. Mm. Yeah, we had a constraint society. Now we have an achievement society. Mm. It's the way he frames it. I feel like it's really true. Um, yeah, definitely. ADHD, the first time that they even, um, someone wrote about or studied it was like the 17, 1700s. Mm. Right. Um, but then it was really during the Industrial Revolution and when, you know, school became like... Um, universal in in some countries uh that it became an obvious problem like Mm. kids couldn't sit still in class they weren't you know adhd is not only about sitting still it's also just about not um kind of in and out like so you're either hyper hyperactive or inattentive and um it's actually better to be hyperactive if you want to do well in school than Mm. it is to be inattentive Mm. yeah right because uh inattentive is is the kid staring at the clouds yeah you know, not really focusing on what they're meant to be focusing on, which is school in this in this case. But um, I've also read things, and I don't know how much I believe this, that ADHD, um, it actually, it probably evolved for like to benefit hunters, right? I don't know if you've heard this before. No. So, well, if you're hunting, um, you kind of need to be hyper-focused on a certain situation and sur- survival life or death, you need to eat, um, and you need to have, you need to be adaptable to certain circumstances like, oh, well, we're chasing these elk, um, but they do something unpredictable. You need to be able to adapt. With ADHD, you can hyper-focus, especially if it, you tend to hyper-focus on really stupid shit, Mm -hmm. but you can hyper-focus if it's like life or death. If, um, if you need to, if, for example, if something is due in the next day, yeah. someone with ADHD will spend the whole day working on it. No mm. problem. Yeah. Right? Um, it's like, where did this energy come from? How come I wasn't able to do this for months? Um, but that's that's just the thing. It's like life or death. You're, you're fighting to survive yeah. in that case. Even though you're not going to die if you don't 
put this thing on, uh, out, uh, you know, or out if you don't hand this thing in. But yeah. You know, and now we're eugenicizing that phenotype with pharmaceutical transhumanism. Yeah. yeah. Give me that. Ah, <laughs> yeah, go for it. I have ADHD. <laughs> Well, that's also, I need to stop having ADHD. That's also the sort of uh, young Chul Han in, in Burnout Society talks about this. And then Yuval Noah Harari talks about this in Sapiens. Are, um, not Sapiens, uh, 20, 21 Problems for the 21st Century, mm-hmm. something like that. He talks about how like the favorable traits used to be like just consistency. Like if you can just do the same thing, like work hard, kind of stay focused stay stay mellow like that's what got you a good life in like the 50s and the 40s like you can go work the same job for you get married work the same job for 50 years Mm -hmm. but now it's adaptability like those traits won't get you anywhere if you're like if you're not adaptable if you're not open to change you're gonna drown because it's like everything's gig economy every jobs are so temporary now everything changes so fast there's no one who just goes out and does the same thing for for 40 years anymore there's no job there's like no jobs like that that exist except for like manufacturing and shit like that well um so now you need to be adaptable. You need to just be like, just be able to deal with change, deal with like your life coming down and like going back up over and over again. I think anybody can learn that. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I said the other day, I was, I'm positivity pilled, right? Yeah. I, you know, what I do doesn't come naturally to me, but I've learned how to do it. And I think there is something to seeking achievement and, and finding a goal and actually, you know, wanting to stick to it. Even though like you're the one who's like, you're the one who decides what goal it is. I don't actually believe that like, oh, someone's naturally, I'm born to be a director. No, like you decide to do that and then you, you go for it. Yeah. But you have to have a tool set. You have to learn how to get there. And if you have a weakness, you can overcome that weakness. Yeah. I, I genuinely, I really believe that. Mm. Um, I'm negativity pilled. Uh oh. If you have a weakness, <laughs> you will succumb to it. And you specifically, not everyone, but you watching the podcast. Will succumb to your weakness. Well, it's, I mean, that's another one of those myths we follow, right? Is that like you're born to do something and we frame like so many people just feel like losers because they just don't have that thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, you pick a goal that isn't significant and then you, it gains significance through learning about it. Yeah. Right. You, you pick something like, I want to do this eventually and like I'm just going to work towards it. And then like that goal gets more and more significant and more and more valuable as you learn more about it on the, on the journey to get there. And by the time you're reaching that goal, it feels really significant. But like, just no one. Yeah, no, what fucking who's who the fuck is born to do anything? No, I don't like think one in one thousand people who are just like, oh, I played piano since I was three. And I'm a That's what it player. is. That's what it is. Yeah. It's like any you look at any grandmaster chess player, Magnus Carlson. He was playing since he was a little kid. Yeah, you know, like that's just what it is. And they usually have parents who uh, played chess professionally or know very well, right? So they learn. A lot of kids burn out. And they never end up getting that, but they they're going to be fucking way better than someone who picks it up uh, later on life and only spends like a year doing it. Right. But they, um, did what happen? I was born to make art. Me. <laughs> I never made a decision to make art. I was genetically predis- predetermined. And if you feel like a loser, it's cause you are, and you'll chase your goals and you'll fail. Uh Oh, <laughs> so, negativity pills. Cool. So, so wrapping it up. Bring it, bring it to a head. Yeah, we, we've we've gone we've gone over time, but that's good. You're we working, have lots to talk about. You're working yeah. on this video. Uh, yeah. What's the timeline looking like? January? Yeah. When you when you um, that's what I'm trying. Yeah, to he, he wrote, I wrote on, the, um, on the on the deadline wall, January 2024. Bummer doc out. I want to get it out. That's that's a, that's the latest end of January. That's yeah. I, I really want to get out. Um, I um probably gonna have someone help me with the edit. Um, because there's still a lot left to do. Um. I don't know. I'm really bad at like figuring out like how long it's going to take me. Yeah. I was saying summer for the longest time and then summer passed and now, yeah, it's November. It's November the 5th, 5th of November. Mm. Yeah. If you, um, if you don't give yourself hard deadlines, you will be a perfectionist. Yes. Yeah, so that's another benefit of community is we can, uh, we'll, we'll remember this and hold you to it. That's good. Please. Yeah. No, yeah. do that. Um, what was your last video? How long ago? A year. A year. A year ago, yeah. And what do you, you average like a million views per video. Like you're pretty consistently, don't you? Um, yeah, I mean, I got I got help from uh, Moist Critical recently. So my past three videos, he shouted them out. Oh, sick. So that's what, like, you know, but usually, yeah, like, yeah, they grow over time. Uh, a lot of the older ones. A lot of the older ones got a million views organically. I think I had like six f- videos. Friend of the show, Moist Critical. He watches every episode. <laughs> 
Wait, do you, um, yeah, I know you're joking, but uh, the um, for now, he's cool. He might. We're actually just manifesting it. <laughs> manifest it. Hell yeah! No, that guy is so cool. Like, I was actually really surprised how like actually like charitable and nice he was with that. I could see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, last video. Last video was a year ago, and hmm. it took four months that one, but it was way easier than this one. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the Bundy Doc. Yeah, I'm, I'm hyped. You should prepare it here. Yeah, yeah. You should prepare. We've got a projector, and we we invite a bunch of people over, and we all watch it. I would love to. Yeah. 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 yeah that sounds great. Yeah. Cool. cool I'll right. do that. January. Yeah. Bundy Doc. January. Okie's weird stories. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, and I can't wait to watch the the people in Bundy as uh, the climate crisis worsens get uh, in bigger and bigger fights with the government because then they're going to be they're going to be shooting at each other. They can go going, bam, 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 bam. bam, bam, bam. bam.